Our scripture lesson is found uh, in the gospel according to Luke, chapter number 13. I'll begin reading in verse number 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which to work, on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it to water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage? on the Sabbath day. When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame and the entire crowd was rejoicing at the wonderful things being done by him. Pray with me, please. Thank you for this word which is written. And now may your spirit bring it to life in a manner in which it will be written in our hearts and in our souls. And now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. Amen. We have power. And we have a voice. Even if we may want to shirk or evade that reality by clinging to notions of our smallness. We have power and we have a voice. Once we put the name of Christ on a sign out by the road in front of our church, we stake this claim that we have power and we have a voice. Once we began to hang crosses up in this room as symbols of our faith, we stake that claim that we have power and we have a voice. Once we built an altar in this space and called it God's altar, we made that claim that we have power And we have a voice. Once we designated ourselves as an open and affirming congregation and gather in part to worship this month as a celebration of LGBTQ pride, we have claimed for ourselves to have a particular kind of power and a particular kind of voice. I'm going to step outside my comfort zone, and I'm going to ask you to step outside of your comfort zone, too, and act differently than we normally do. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Will you repeat after me? Will you do that? We have power. We have power. We have a voice. Listen to you. You sound like a bunch of Pentecostals just because I asked you to do it. (laughs) But now that we have declared that together, now that we have established that, that we have power and we have a voice, we can move on along to the more important question, which is how are we going to employ that power And what are we going to say with that voice that we've all claimed together that we have? 
Here's another truth that we have to lean against. Because we have power, because we have a voice, we must lean into the truth that that power can be used to heal and to liberate. But power and voice can also be used to debilitate and oppress. One thing I want us to note is that it is made clear by Luke that the event which is described here in his gospel occurs in a sacred time and a sacred space. Before Luke gets on to the events which took place, he establishes that at the very beginning of this passage. It took place on the Sabbath, and it took place in the synagogue. What takes place, which would be important in its own right, is imbued with additional importance because it took place in a sacred time. It took place in a sacred space. One Sunday, a couple of years ago, and I don't expect you all to remember it, but we lit a candle here in front of the church. We used the candle as a way to remember and perhaps to grieve. All of the times when people across our country, across the world, entered into sacred spaces at sacred times, hoping to find a safe place and instead were injured spiritually or psychologically by the manner in which power was used to oppress and voice was used to diminish. To diminish. We approach this in a confessional manner. I ask us to remember the places and times where perhaps we had been hurt in such spaces. I ask us to remember the times when we have caused pain in such spaces. All so that we could walk a path of healing together. People's comments let me know that it struck a chord. That act of remembrance made clear what we already knew. That that which takes place in sacred time and in sacred space has additional import. Whether we want it or not, we have power and we have a voice. And we have claimed to have a particular kind of power a particular kind of voice. We all know that one of the stereotypes of the church is that it is a place where vulnerable people have often been hurt. But what if we were to claim that the church didn't have to live out of that stereotype? What if instead we turned the sacred time into a time of healing and the sacred space into a space of safety? Our text asks us to consider another question as well. What was it which bent this woman? And I believe the text asks us to con consider more than just the medical science answers to that question. What was it, what were the forces which bent this woman and left her unable to stand? Was it the way in which the world ceased seeing her as a person and began seeing her as a problem. There are always people in the world who carry burdens. There are people who carry burdens of sickness or poverty or emotional and psychological pain and sometimes the people around them stop seeing them as people and instead as a problem to be solved. When people saw her, did she feel the weight of their prejudice on her back because they saw only her limitations and not her potential? Did that prejudice, as much as her infirmity, keep her in bondage and suffering? How easy it is to see people that way. 
I don't know or understand the psychology behind it. But it's ever too easy to see people as a sum total of their problems, of their weaknesses, of their mistakes. And to stop seeing their potential as human beings. Was it this way of being seen which left her bent and unable to stand? What caused this woman to be bent? And the question of even more substance and even more power and importance, what might lead to her liberation? I want to ask that once again because that is the kind of question that people with power and a, and a voice ought to be asking. What would lead to her liberation? What might liberate us? In the face of people who have been bent and in the face of that which is bent within us, what might lead to liberation? There's a nuance to this story which is plainly present but is sometimes missed. Jesus does a strange thing. It wouldn't be the first and it won't be the last. But Jesus does a strange thing. You see, Luke goes to a lot of trouble to highlight the severity of her infirmity. He first tells, her that, or tells us that she had been in this condition for 18 years, giving us an idea of the length of her suffering, of the severity of it. He then tells us that she was bent over, which places in our minds a mental picture of her circumstance. And thirdly, we are informed that she was quite unable to stand. Luke seems intent on driving home this point of the severity and the seriousness of the, her predicament. Now to the strange thing which Jesus did. The text says that Jesus saw her. Here's a bit, a bit of trivia to impress your friends with. 138 times in the four Gospels, Jesus is said to have seen. To have seen a person or to have seen a crowd. In this text, we are told that Jesus sees her. Now, there's nothing in the story to indicate that she attempted to be seen. There's nothing in the story to indicate that she requested to be healed. We are only told that Jesus saw her. And in her, and in her condition, the condition that Luke made so plain, wouldn't you have expected Jesus to go to her? To move out to her? Wouldn't you think he would make his way to her, but he doesn't? He calls this woman who's bent over, barely able to move, this woman who had become a problem to her community, to her family. He called her over. Jesus calls this woman who's seemingly barely able to move to get up and to come toward him. And by the time she gets to him, he speaks to her as if she had already been healed. As commentator and blogger Alice McKenzie puts it, the exact thing that she cannot do and yearns to do is precisely the thing Jesus empowers her to do. Jesus has enabled her to do precisely the thing she wasn't able to do and it began with the way he saw her and what he imagined her able to do. As the church of Jesus Christ, who are imbued with power, who possess a voice, we are not in the business of charity. No matter how much charity cost us, we are not in the business of charity. We are in the business of being allies to the oppressed, to the bent, and to the broken, no matter how much being allies cost us. That is the business we are in. 
I know that not because I read a book about it, but because I know this bit woman in the story. And I know the bit people of the world because sometimes I am bent too. And when I am bent and when I am broken, there is one thing I don't want. I don't want to be pitied. If someone doesn't like me, I'll be all right. I can't imagine why they wouldn't like me. <laughs> because let's face it, what is not to like? But if someone doesn't like me, I'll be okay. If someone ignores me, I may wish that they wouldn't ignore me, but at the end of the day, I'm going to be okay. What I don't want, when I am down and when I am bent is to be pitied. What I want is somebody to walk up alongside of me and stir up my imagination so that I can begin to imagine doing the things that right now I can't do. That's what I want. Don't pity me. Call me forward and imagine with me what might yet be. I don't think poor people are different from me. I don't think hungry people are different from me. I don't think people who are oppressed, whether it's because of the color of their skin, the place they are from, their sexual orientation, or simply their place in the social order, I don't think they are different from me. People don't want to be pitied. They want folks to walk beside them and help them imagine doing things which as of yet they hadn't been able to do. We aren't in the business of charity. We aren't in the business of dispensing pity. We're in the business of being allies with imaginations. That's who we are. Allies with imaginations for what can yet be in this world, in this church, in this community, and in each side of one of us. One of the great enemies of our faith and discipleship is our admiration of Jesus. It's not what the gospel calls us to do. I have on occasion shared with you a line from a, a camp song that not all of the camp directors like. Sung to the tomb of We Are the Champions by Queen. <laughs> the line in the song goes, Jesus is a cool dude. And then it goes on to recount all, at least some of the cool things that Jesus did. It isn't exactly church language, but expresses our sentiments about Jesus sometimes. We think Jesus is the coolest dude of all. But such admiration can be an enemy to our faith, for the Gospels do not call us to admire Jesus. The Gospels call us to emulate Jesus, to model his behavior. Admiration doesn't cost us anything. The affirmation that Jesus is a cool dude and we as Christians think he was the coolest of all doesn't require anything of us. We might admire Jesus' capacity to physically heal as something that is beyond us, but what is not beyond us is the capacity to offer unconditional acceptance and to see in one another in such a way that the one thing we cannot do and yearn to do is the thing that we are empowered to do by our walking together with one another. Admiration of Jesus on this count is the easy path. The challenge from this text is that we join him. The challenge of the text is that we take the power that we have and the voice which we possess and use them as tools to liberate and to open up brand new doors, possibilities. This past week, we had a group in camp from Greenville, South Carolina. Gamecock fans, <laughs> Clemson fans. I did all that I could to love them anyway. <laughs> but one of the things that we had on our schedule last week was to build a handicap ramp. We had two days to build it because other things during the week uh, also had to be done. Two days. That was what we had. We learned that the gentleman who would use the handicap ramp was stuck in a rehab center because he couldn't get in his house. There was an eight-foot drop. Of course, 
there were stairs there, but they had to be removed. An eight-foot drop. And with the terrain, the ramp had to be 100 feet long, zigzagging back and forth with switchbacks. The gentleman who helps me at Camp Earl has built over 100 and oh, rather 450 ramps. He said it was the longest ramp he'd ever built, and it was the most complicated ramp he had ever built. The group from South Carolina was made up of 13 people, two adult males, one adult woman, six adult young women, and three adult young men. The majority of them, not in senior high, but in middle school. Well, Earl and I, knowing the size of the ramp we were building, as soon as they walked in, we sized them up wondering if we could get this thing done. And we, <laughs> looking at them and knowing their lack of experience, we made an unfair assessment, and we began to doubt that we could do it. We began to make a contingency plan about how to get some people down that, up there to, to help us to finish. Robert Cox, your name was on the list. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll shorten the story. We built that ramp. Despite the fact that they had no experience and very little experience using the tools that were required, we built it because they knew it needed to be built. They listened, they learned, they applied what they learned, and they persevered through the June humidity and through the difficulty of the terrain. And we finished that ramp in two days. I couldn't help but say to them, and perhaps it because this text was waiting on me this Sunday, you need to understand what you did, young people. The doctors had done what they could do. The rehab center had done what they could do. But you helped this man to do the one thing that he couldn't do, which was to go home and be in the one place he wanted to be. That is the business that we are in, to help one another reimagine and to do those things which before we could not do. When we finished, we celebrated with ice cream. <laughs> we will walk this journey together. We will help one another along. And when we experience those moments together, where we see someone able to do those things, which before they could not do, we'll celebrate. Perhaps we'll even celebrate with ice cream. Amen. <laughs>